Glad you're here this morning. And a couple announcements before we uh, jump into our teaching. First of all, um, if you are not able to make it on a Sunday morning, remember that we have Saturday night services. Uh, last night we had uh, approximately counting children, uh, right around 120 that joined us for services last night. So uh, keep that in mind if, uh, if uh, Sunday morning does not work for you for some reason or so forth, that, uh, that Saturday night's available. Invite your friends who are tied up on Sunday morning also to Saturday night. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a unique time of worship. And, uh, and so at a unique time, so, so uh, let's continue to remember that, keep that as a matter of prayer. Also, uh, this morning, we want to thank all of our online community that joins us every week. Most of us here probably aren't aware, but there's about 200 screens that, uh, that join us every week for worship online. And I do want to mention that the next couple weeks, our online service will be tentative because we're doing some uh, work on our, on our side screens and our HD production that will, uh, that will leave in question whether this week or next week we are live online. So if you're a part of our online community on a regular basis, uh, join us. Come on in and be with us that Sunday, and, uh, and it would be good for us to, uh, uh, to be together. So plan that over the next couple weeks if, uh, if you're normally, normally on Line. And then a major, major announcement for us is that Pastor Marquita Rieger um, has made a decision to retire. And uh, many of us here know Pastor Marquita. She's been a major part of our staff and congregation for years and years. She's been on staff for well over 10 years and has been very significant in major parts of our ministry here. Everything from connect groups to uh, our counseling center to celebrate the journey. And, and so she will remain a part of our congregation, of course. So we'll see her on a regular basis and we'll see her family and so forth. But her role will change a little bit, uh, seeing that she won't be on staff with us. So what we want to do over the next couple of weeks is we want to send her a note you know, um, uh, if you have her address, send her a note at home. If you don't have her address, bring it by the resource center, by the office, and we'll collect those and, and we'll give those to her. But, uh, but let's show some appreciation to Pastor Marquita for her years of great ministry uh, here at the church. And again, that's not going to end. She'll still be around. And so that's a good, good thing uh, for us. Well, we're involved in our teaching series, The Comeback. Let's say a word of prayer before we uh, dive into our teaching. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, your love and for your grace, for your mercy, for your presence in this place. And Lord, for the way that you impact our lives. Jesus, I pray this morning to each one of us that our hearts would be open uh, to your work, that our hearts would be open to your grace effective for us today. Lord, so move in us, speak to us, Lord, and find us as a, uh, as a group of people that desperately want to hear you, follow you, have you work in us and through us. In your name, Lord. Amen. So we're a part of the uh, Comeback series. And you know, the narrative for Comeback has been the same for all of us and even through the scriptures. And the narrative is simply this, that we either sin or tragedy comes into our life through circumstances. It creates hard times and difficult times. We cry out to God and God in his goodness does a redemptive work for us. That's sort of the narrative of comeback, and it's all through the scriptures. And all of us, every one of us, need a comeback at one time or another in our lives. In fact, our scriptural comeback story today comes from the book of Judges. And it's a story that you're probably familiar with. It's the story of Samson. And if you've gone to Sunday school at all, or, or, or you know, Samson is an iconic story, right? It's one that sticks out to us. And, and in fact, it's such a dominant story that we learn from the time that we're, we're little in the, in the scripture that it's hard to believe that it's covered in only four chapters. That the, that the story of Samson appears in Judges 13 through Judges 16, but it's such a powerful story that it's like larger than life. And you know the story of Samson, right? Samson is God's deliverer for Israel when Israel was in an oppressed time to the Philistines. And, uh, and, and Samson, when he was born and as he grew, he took a Nazarite vow, which meant he vowed that there would be certain things that he wouldn't participate in life. And he made this uh, special vow to God in relationship with him. And so there's a few things that were attached to that. Like one is, is that he wouldn't drink wine. Uh, another is that he wouldn't cut his hair. And, and if you know the story of Samson, the story of Samson is that his strength, 
His incredible strength, that he had massive strength, came from his hair. So the story goes, right? As long as his hair was intact, as long as his, his hair continued to grow, as long as it was long, he would continue to be strong. I'm glad God doesn't use that method today. But, but nevertheless, he, he did choose that with Samson. And, and Samson found his strength in his hair. And you know how the story goes for Samson. Now, ultimately, they cut his hair, and, and, uh, and he reveals the source of his strength, and he ends up imprisoned. And, and you know how that story goes. And, 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 you know, when you think about Samson, when you read those four chapters, it doesn't take long to figure out what knocked Samson down. It wasn't what we might think. Like, for instance, it, it wasn't his circumstances. It wasn't that, that Samson had tough circumstances and that's what knocked him down. But because in reality, although the circumstances weren't great because they were oppressed, the nation of Israel was oppressed of the Philistines, Samson was God's deliverer. He was their deliverer to their oppression and to their circumstances. In fact, at Samson's uh, announcement of his birth, it's, uh, it's very divine in nature. Like, for instance, an angel visits his mother and talks to his mother about the promise of Samson. It's found in Judges 13, and this is what it says. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to her, Samson's mom, and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son, and he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Big announcement, right? Sounds like a savior coming for Israel. Man, it's a, it's a huge deal that Samson's going to be born and that there's promise attached to him. There's a change of circumstance attached to Samson. So it wasn't like circumstances that kept Samson down. It wasn't dashed dreams that kept Samson down. It wasn't like, oh, you know, he had these dreams and they weren't fulfilled, so therefore it knocked him down. In fact, Samson was supposed to be the deliverer of the dreams for Israel. He was like the, the, the hope of their future. It was Samson. He was the one who was supposed to make these things a reality for, for them. In fact, if you know the story of Samson, it wasn't even that he trusted the wrong people that knocked him down. You know, sometimes we can trust somebody and then, then they end up not trustworthy and, and, and then they kind of knock us down. But, but, but that wasn't even Samson's case, although he had a habit of trusting the wrong people. And he didn't make wise decisions in who he trusted, right? Because he continued to, and, and, and regularly, and, and, and time after time, trusted, uh, trusted the oppressors. And time after time, they, they betrayed him. But it wasn't even that that was Samson's undoing. Samson, as you read the story and understand it, was knocked down by his own sin. He was knocked down by his, by his own choice, by his own sins and, and the pathway that he decided to walk. But yet, even, even Samson, who decided to walk at his own pathway, God, in his great mercy, continued to reach out to Samson. I mean, in the midst of Samson's sin and in the midst of his choices, God just continued to reach out to him, continued to rescue him, continued to call him to himself. And, and for Samson and God... It, it wasn't, like a, it wasn't like a one and done scenario. It wasn't like a, you know, a total collapse where, where you know, Samson just totally collapsed. And, 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 and it wasn't even a God's out to get you plot line. I mean, there's nothing like that when it comes to Samson and, and, and God in the scriptures. God's grace showed up time after time after time to rescue Samson. And then every time he rescued Samson, he, he tried to establish Samson back on the right path. He tried to establish Samson back onto his role as a leader for Israel and, and back in his role as a deliverer for Israel. But it was Samson's continual journey down this path of self-destruction and sin that ultimately knocked Samson down. Now, this journey that Samson was on, right, of his, of his own destruction, this journey that he was on is, is really characterized by a few things. So as you read through the story, you realize that, that one, of the, one of the characteristics of, of Samson's journey that, that knocked him down was that Samson was possessed by a lust of his eyes. I mean, I mean Samson had it bad for Philistine women. I mean... Part of his vow as a, uh, as a Nazarite was that he would stay faithful within his tribe of Israelites. And man, he just adored Philistine women. 
and the lust of his eyes just possessed him and it, and it overtook him. But, but, you know, when we think about this idea of lust, right, and the, and the lust of the eyes, sometimes, sometimes it's a physical issue, like with Samson, right, where he had this lust of his eyes for these Philistine women. But, but sometimes the lust that comes to us through our eyes is, uh, is for different things. Like, for instance, uh, sometimes we lust over possessions. It doesn't take a few moments to understand when you walk through that den of iniquity known as the King of Prussia Mall that... Uh, <laughs> That, I mean, right? I mean, you just get, like, like, you get enamored by stuff, especially that news section. Have you been through that news section? I mean, you walk through it, and it's like there's all these things, and it glitters, and it, and it shines, and it's like, oh, wow. And next thing, you, you leave wanting things that you never even knew existed before you went, and it's a terrible situation. And, or you're watching the ball game, right? And, 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 and there's the car commercial, and here comes this new car, and you're like, what in the world? My car can't do that. I have to start my car up with a key like the old-fashioned way. And it doesn't preheat itself. It doesn't start itself up on its own. How, can I, how have I lived all these years of my life without my car starting itself up? And, and you know, we, we, we get filled with lust for things. We visit a friend, right? And it doesn't take long. You visit a friend, and next thing you know, you, you see their built-in pool, or you see their new furniture, or you see that big screen TV. And next thing you know, right? What comes in through our eyes all of a sudden takes possession of us. Well, we lust over possessions sometimes. Or sometimes we, we lust over positions, right? We want, we want that next level up. I mean, we want to we, we wanna keep climbing that ladder. And, and, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the excelling at work. And, and, in fact, the Scripture tells us we should work hard, right? We should, we should have a great work ethic. We should work as unto the Lord, right, as we give our effort and we're, and we're faithful in our service and in our, in our work ethic. But, but when we desire the next position so much that it becomes like dominant in our lives, it's just enough to knock us off track from where God would perhaps have us go. Well, not only possessions, not only position, but sometimes we, sometimes we lust after popularity. Now, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm, 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 I'm thinking this week when I thought about that popularity. And I thought, what am I, in high school, middle school? What are you talking about popularity? But... But honestly, there are many of us who, who we want the highest level of attention from the people around us. And we want the highest level of influence. And, and if we don't get the attention or we don't have the influence that, that we think we should, it bothers us deeply. And so even in, our, in, our, even in our, our relationship with our friends, we're trying to seek that level of influence and we're, we're trying to seek that level of attention. And when we don't receive it, we can, we can like get all twisted up inside. Now, I believe God puts us in places, right? He, he gives us positions for his purposes, but it's for his glory and right? not for ours. It's for his purposes, not for ours. So, so we have to be aware of that. So, I mean, this idea of, of being filled with lust, right, lust that comes through our eyes for, for whatever reasons, we, we have to be careful of that. Samson lusted after what, by his vows, he could not have. He lusted after Philistine women. He took a vow that he would remain faithful within Israel. And, and in fact, in, in his story, right, four chapters, it's filled with three different Philistine women that he pursues. And in every case, every one betrays him. And the women in the story, they easily represent Israel's oppression to the Philistines. I mean, because Samson, he desires them, and, 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 he, and he wants them. And, and then they, they're always trying to enslave him. They're trying to capture him. And, and they continue to attempt to enslave Samson over and over and over again. But he is just possessed in the lust of his eyes for them. And he doesn't ever break away. Well, you know, that's one of the characteristics of, of like, Samson's journey, where he's going and what, what has a hold of him. Another thing about Samson that you learn is that, is that Samson is enamored by his gifts more than he is the gift giver. Like, like when you read through Samson, Samson loves the fact that he's stronger than everybody else. He loves the reality that, that, that really he's, he's kind of smarter than everybody else too. God has given him this great ability of strength and of wit and, and instead of deciding, hey, I'm going to honor God with these gifts that he's, that he's given him, he, he uses the gifts for his own purposes. Like, like he used his strength and he used his position. He used his position 
as the deliverer, right, as the judge, as the leader for the nation of Israel, he used his position to not say it in a soft way, to open the door to get Philistine women. Because why else would they be interested in him? They wouldn't be interested in an Israelite, but because of Samson's position, right, because of who he is and what he can do, they're all after him. And the reason they're after him is because they want to enslave him. They want to take him captive. They understand the power of his gifts that, that, that God's given him, but, but he uses that position and so forth just kind of to serve himself. He uses his gift of strength. In fact, when you read through the four chapters, and there's many feats of great strength that Samson, you know, Samson does, he uses almost all except for one or two as a way to take vengeance on those who's crossed him. That's what he uses his strength for. If you go through and you read the story, you're like, man, he's always taking vengeance on them and vengeance on them and vengeance on them, using his strength again for his own purposes. When he struck down and killed 30 Philistines and he stole their clothing, he did it to pay a debt because somebody betrayed him and gave the answer to the riddle his wife did to the other Philistines. So what he did is he killed 30 Philistines and then took their clothing and gave it to 30 other Philistines. When he tied the foxes together and he lit them on fire and and put them out in their wheat fields, so all their wheat fields burned down, it was in response to an act of vengeance of when he was crossed. When he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey... He was acting in vengeance. He was like, like getting revenge for what it is that they, they did to him. In fact, in fact, I think maybe, at least for me, the, 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 the most fun act of vengeance, so to say, maybe, that, that Samson did that showed both his strength and his wit was when he was with a Philistine woman at one point in these four chapters, uh, the Philistines know that he's there and they surround where he's at. They surround where he's at and they believe they have him captured. So Samson... And the scripture doesn't tell us exactly how. It does say that he cried out to God. But the scripture doesn't say exactly how. But somehow he escapes when they've got him surrounded. But in the process of escaping, not only does he just escape, but he goes to the city walls and he steals the gates of the city walls and he walks away with them. Now, now I don't know if you get what city walls are about in those days. They're about protection. You're protecting yourself from the enemy. City walls are important and gates are important. And here they are surrounding an area where they think they're going to get Samson. Samson somehow gets away and then he just doesn't get away. He goes to the city walls and he tears down their gates. He unhinges them and he walks off with them. Now, I don't know how big these gates are. But nevertheless, the message that Samson sends to the Philistines is huge. And here's the message. You can't protect yourself from me. I am way too smart for you, and I'm way too strong for you, and you're vulnerable in my presence. Man, you can't stop me. I can do whatever it is that I want to do to you, and you cannot protect yourself. I mean, Samson was like really enamored by the gifts that God had given him. Way, way more than he was enamored by God. He was enamored by himself more than he was enamored by God. Well, then the the final thing I I, I think along Samson's journey, right? The the final thing was not just the lust for his eyes and being enamored with himself and what he could do and how God had gifted him. But, But the third and kind of the final thing was that Samson never bought in to God's plan or God's call for his life. Now, there's many times where Samson got in trouble, right? And he'd gotten in trouble and he cried out, remember me, like, he did that when they were, had him surrounded before he stole the city gates. And, and God did. Whenever he cried out, remember me, God remembered him. But, but he never really fully embraced who God created him to be. He didn't seek God about the decisions that he was making in life or the direction that he was heading in. In fact, in these, in these short four chapters about Samson's life, there are five specific examples of him breaking his vows to God. Five specific examples in these four chapters of him going his own direction and and not caring what it is that God desired. In fact, he never evaluated, uh, you know, his actions and, and whether or not they were pleasing to God, whether or not it's what God wanted. 
He never thought, do I have the right attitude? Do I have a godly attitude? Am I taking godly actions? Is what I'm doing pleasing to God or is it displeasing to God? Am I being self-centered or am I not? Am I living into the role? He never even thought about that stuff. He never evaluated where he was. He just simply wanted what he wanted and he took action without any higher advice or any higher insight. In fact, it had gotten so bad for Samson. It had gotten so bad for Samson, and you might remember this in the story. It had gotten so bad for Samson, who is supposed to be God's deliverer for Israel, that actually the people of Israel came to him one day, and they said, all you ever do is cause problems for us. All you ever do is create trouble. Man, the Philistines are at our door now because of your activity, because of what you're doing, and, and, and we can't take it anymore. Like, you're supposed to lead us, and, and we're supposed to find something greater in life because of you, and, and you're nothing but trouble. You just deliver problems to us. And so they ask him, because they can't take him physically, they ask him, can we turn you over to the Philistines? Because Samson, Samson never led like he was supposed to. Samson didn't inspire like he was called to inspire. He didn't deliver anything that wasn't just for himself. In fact, Samson never showed up for Israel. I mean, when you read the story and and, and you read between the lines, it, it almost looks like Samson had no interest at all in serving Israel. He had taken the life that God had given him, the gifts that God had given him, and he had turned them completely in upon himself. And, you know, Samson thought he was invincible. I mean, Samson thought, hey, man, they'll never get me. I mean, I'm invincible. I'm smarter than them. I'm stronger than them. I'm... But, but here's the issue. The issue is the enemy waited him out. The enemy always waits us out. The Philistines waited and waited and waited until finally Samson released the information that knocked him down, and he couldn't get back up on his own. Now, now, you know, I I think in the story of Samson, I think in the story of Samson, there is a major, what I'm calling, pre-comeback lesson in the story of Samson. And that's this. God offered Samson grace all the way along his journey. Even though Samson was going his own way, even though Samson was doing his own thing, even though Samson was breaking all of his vows, even though Samson was sinning, even though Samson was just full of his own self-centeredness, man, he's walking his own way, not caring a bit about what God thinks or, 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 or what God desires from him. Even though all of that's going on, God is continually reaching out to Samson, offering him his grace. Every time Samson cries out, Lord, remember me, I'm in trouble, God delivers him. God helps him. But Samson, Samson would never receive the fullness of God's grace. Now, now this is what I mean by that. What I mean by that is whenever Samson cried out, hey, God, remember me, I'm in trouble, I need your help, and God delivered him, well, of course he received that, right? He's like, all right, yeah, I want God's help in my times of trouble, so he received that. But he did not walk on the path that God asked him to. Like when God called him and God created him for a purpose, well, he was interested in God's help to get him out of trouble, but he really wasn't interested in God's purpose for his life. And sometimes we get confused about this. But you know, when God calls us to his purposes, that is an incredible offer of grace. It is. I mean, the best I can do to explain it is, is, is it's, like, uh, it's like I'm the runt on the playground, Right? I'm the runt on the playground, and I don't have an athletic bone in my body, which is absolutely untrue, because I'm incredibly athletic. But, but anyhow, but it's like, let's say, I'm this runt on the playground, right? And, and, and man, it comes time, and, and here come these two athletic studs in third grade, and, man, they're great at everything, and, right, we're enamored by them, and, and it comes time to pick up the kickball teams, and I'm always picked last, but it comes time for this captain to pick, to pick and the first pick he makes is me. And I'm like, yeah, I can't believe it. Woo! Man, I mean, I'm high-fiving everybody. I try extra hard because he picked me. Man, it's such an exciting event. That's what it is when God says, I have a purpose in your life. I want to accomplish something through you. I want to do something major in and, and through your life. 
I mean, that's huge. It's an incredible offer of grace. But, but Samson, he landed in this place where he like, he like received the grace to, to get him out of trouble, but he never embraced the full grace of God for what he was calling him to in, in life. And I think the pre-comeback lesson here, right, is this. Take the grace God offers you now. Like, like if you can say, hey, you know, my sin or my, or, or, or my activity or going my own way is not caused to fall in my life as of yet. Hey, fantastic. You know, that's great, right? That's God's provident care for you. But, but take the grace that God offers you now. Receive it and, and, and get on his path and, 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 and follow him with passion and, and seek his direction. In fact, if you find any of these temptations or any of these characteristics in your journey that, that show up in Samson's life, man, if, you, if they've taken residence in you, take the grace that God offers you now. Find the help to overcome the, the things that possess you. And, and whether, it's a, whether it's, hey, man, I, I, I need a deeper prayer life or I need a prayer partner or I need to be involved in a group where, where we talk about these things or, or I need deep counseling, whatever it is you need, seek those out. So that you can, you, can, you can know what God's called you to and how he's called you. And, and, and don't be enamored with yourself. Man, be enamored with God. And, and become a worshiper. Right? Worship him and, 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 and find God's plan for your life and, and walk on that. And if you need to talk to somebody, boy, make that call and, and, and get together and, and, and talk. But, but receive God's grace that he extends to you now. Because God's plan is always best for you. I mean, I like to say, hey, is it possible to have a comeback before we've even fallen? It almost seems like Samson was offered that time after time after time. But, but then the reality sets in, right? Because there's some of us here that in spite, of, uh, in, in, in spite of the offer of God along our journey, we've experienced the fall. Like the choices we've made or the, or the, or the path we've walked, it's ultimately, it's ultimately happened. I mean, here's Samson's, here's what happens in, in Samson in Judges 16, right? So he reveals to Delilah that, 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 hey, if you cut my hair, I lose my strength. So the Philistines come in in the, in the evening when he's sleeping one time and they, and they cut his hair. And then this is what happens in Judges 16. Then she, Delilah, called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and he thought, well, I'll go out as before and I'll just shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. As you read on in the story, right, in this, this, this fall that happens to Samson ultimately because of the path that he chose, the, oh, you see other signs there, right? Two results that come from that is one is the false gods are praised, right? They praise Dagon, their false god, for delivering Samson into their hands. And, and, and then they gloated over their victory. I mean, the scripture says that, that not only did they put him in, you know, into, into prison, not only did they work him as, uh, you know, at, at the grinding stone, but then they called him out to entertain them. Yeah, when they were in the big gathering, they said, hey, go get Samson, have him come out. And it, and it says he performed for them. Now, now, I don't know what he did in his performance, but it said they made a spectacle of him. And you know, sometimes when, when we make decisions, right, sometimes when, when we sin and, and then that sin becomes apparent and the fall takes place, we can feel a lot like Samson. We can feel like, man... We're now a spectacle. And I need to remind you, and if you're flat on your back, I need to remind you who God is. Because watch what happens in Samson's story. So, so in Judges 21, right, they've gouged his eyes out. In, in Judges 16, verse 21, they gouged his eyes out. They've imprisoned him. They've, they've, they've got him working as, a, as grinding at the grinding stone. In verse 22, that's verse 21. In verse 22, this is what it says. And I hope you catch the magnitude of this. It says, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, I don't know if you catch the magnitude of this, but you know what this says? It says that even in Samson's sin and his falling, 
God was already there showing his presence. God was already there working on his behalf. God was already planning Samson's comeback. And that's just like God. It's just like God because God is a God of comebacks. And I know in this, in this story we read it and we, and we feel bad for Samson, right? Because it says that they made a spectacle of him. But you do get that that, that is not the story of the scripture. That, that, that sin does not make a spectacle of God's people. That, that sin does not make a spectacle of God. It's exactly the opposite that happens. God makes a spectacle of sin. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, he states that very thing. Because it says this. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he, God, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So, I mean, mean, sin doesn't make a public spectacle, right? God makes a public spectacle of sin. And so Samson, in the midst of that big arena where, where they brought him out and he performed, he prayed a prayer that he had prayed many times before. And that prayer is this. Lord, sovereign Lord, remember me. And you know this about God. God does not forget you. God does not forget. And so God empowered Samson, right? And they, and they, and they took Samson over to the, to the two pillars that, that held up the arena. And, and then and they took him there as he asked to. And God strengthened him to be able to knock those pillars down and bring a demise to all of the Philistines there. That we're making a public spectacle of him. Now when you read that, and even when you read it in the scripture, you know, Samson says, you know, let me have my my vengeance. But you know that, that that action was not as much about vengeance as it was Samson, perhaps for the first time in his whole story, living into who God called him to be. Let me take out the oppressors. I will die with them. But let me take them out. And that was the initial significant moment that began the journey for Israel out of the oppression of the Philistines. You know, I I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know this morning if if you're like, you're, you're traveling your own journey in life and you're like, hey man, you know, I'm, I'm traveling on and I'm not seeking God's advice or his wisdom. I'm just doing what it is I want to do. And Man, times are good, man. I mean, you don't understand, Pastor. I have gifts and I have abilities and I can pull things. I, I don't know if that's where you're at. You know, but let me, let me say this to you. And, and, and I want you to hear me. Man, God's offering you grace all along the journey. God's, God's offering you a, a, an opportunity to, 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 to move from your own direction and to stop and to move his direction. And this is what I want to say to you. Man, take the offer of his grace now. Man, he extends it to you in powerful, wonderful ways. Man, receive the offer of his grace to, to change direction and find his plan and, and be enamored by him and, and, and do that. Do that now and, and do that intentionally and, and on purpose. And then for some of us here, right, we, we may have experienced already the, the fall, like where we're knocked flat in our back and and we are receiving the full results of our, of our, of our pathway. And, and if you're there, let me remind you who God is. He is the God that does not forget you. So even if you're flat out on your back, man, cry out to him. Cry out to him for his help and his resources, and his forgiveness and his grace to be active and effective in your life. Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace, for your power. I praise you, Father, because you are the God that does not forget that you remember, that you remember us when, 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 when we believe the times are great and the times are good and there's no problems, man. You remember us and you, you call us and you woo us and, and, and when times take a turn and if they're bad, Lord, and if we're, if we're facing different things, Lord, you remember us there. So Jesus, I pray this morning that in our midst, that, man, we would respond to the grace that you offer, 
that we would be enamored by you. And, and Lord, if we need forgiveness, I, I pray that we would pray for that forgiveness. If we need a change in direction and repentance, I, I pray that we would change our directions by your power and by your grace. Because, Lord, we need your leadership in our lives. So, Jesus, I pray this morning, whether it be pre-comeback or whether it be comeback story, be active and be effective in us. And Lord, I pray that every single one of us, Lord, will respond to your grace, your presence, your activity on our behalf. We love you, Jesus. Lord, in response to your goodness and your grace and your mercy, Lord, receive what it is that we bring. We know that you are the great provider and that you call us to bring a portion back. And so, so Lord, as we do that, as we bring our tithes and our offering, know that this is a testimony that says we understand that you provide all things. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. In your name, Jesus, amen and amen.